Everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hello? Okay. I try to talk pretty loud anyway, so hopefully uh, you all can hear me. Okay, so thanks for coming, and I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking about stop motion animation, which is what I do. Um, I've been working professionally for about 13 years now. Um, I work on a lot of television shows, short films, and commercials, and I've done two feature films. And currently, I'm working at Leica on a new feature film called Paranorman, which will be out in theaters August 17th uh, of next year, 2012. And uh, I, Leica Studios is based right here in Portland. Um, it used to be Will Bitten Studios, and they had a sort of change of ownership, and now they're committed to making some of the most advanced stop motion films ever. <laughs> so um, they're also the same studio that did Coraline, which I animated on for two years. So I have a lot of clips to show, which hopefully will all work out. I had a system, but we'll, it'll, it'll be fine. Um, and I'm going to show the clips and sort of talk a little bit in between. And if you guys have any questions, it's a pretty small group, so I think you could probably take questions as we go. I don't, you know, I don't you have to wait till the end if you have, you know, the first thing thought, just raise your hand. Um, so just a real quick summary. Um, I specialize in stop motion because I like the hands-on approach of it. Um, what makes it different from drawn or computer animation is that everything in the stop motion world exists, pretty much everything, in real life. So everything is built by hand, everything exists in the physical space, and it takes hundreds and hundreds of people to bring a stop motion movie together. So you need all kinds of craftsmen, painters, sculptors, costumers, camera people, lighting people, and animators. And I think what I like most about it is that you know you can see Coraline up on the screen, but you can also see her right there. And this right here, this is that's an actual puppet from the movie. She's fully armatured. Underneath she has a metal skeleton, much like the ones you see on the end there. She's fully posable. Um, that puppet was in many, many shots of the film. And so I really like the idea that you, know, you can touch it, and there it is, and then it's up on the screen. So, but I'll talk a little bit more later about how puppets are made and different aspects of that kind of thing. Um, but I'd like to start off by showing the demo reel. And this, this show reel has um, many different types of shots. They're, it's all my animation. Um, I try to give a little variety, maybe some, some shows that you might recognize. Um, there's some Coraline on there, and a few other TV shows that you may or may not know. Um, and then, so we'll show the, the show reel, and then right after that, we'll, I'll have them play um, some spots for Planner's Peanuts, which Like a House did uh, last Christmas. And I animated on those right before um, I went on to Paranorman. And I didn't do all the shots in those the commercials, but I thought I'd just show the whole thing just to get an idea, because they're really short. So if we could, uh, Patrick, play the, uh, the show reel and the planner spots. OK. So that's it for the clips for a little bit. Um, I'm going to rattle on about animation briefly. Um, Okay, so to understand animation first, you should know a little bit about how movies work. And I never really know how much to tell people because you know sometimes it's a room filled with people that know how animation is done and sometimes it isn't. So if you already know what I'm talking about, just bear with me. Um, so film is essentially an optical illusion. It's a trick that's played on your eye. And there's a science behind it, which is called the persistence of vision. Sounds very fancy. 
But uh, how it works is that the human eye retains an image for a fraction of a second once it sees it. So if you replace that image with a similar image that's slightly different, the image appears to move. So when you watch a movie, you're not watching one long moving picture, but thousands and thousands of still pictures play so quickly that your eye is tricked into seeing the movement. So in stop motion, the animator is moving the puppet 24 times for every second of film that's on the screen. So there's 24 frames in every second of film. So throw out some numbers that are always kind of funny. Um, so Coraline is 101 minutes long, feature film. So that's 145,440 frames. <laughs> so that's a lot of frames to uh, manipulate. So basically, what I do as an animator is Coraline wants to move her arm up like this. I will just move it a tiny, move it a tiny little bit and take a picture. <coughs> move it a tiny little bit and take a picture and so on. And so when the pictures are played together, the arm does that. It's, it's kind of the short version of how it's done. Um, now, in most, you know, in almost all animation, you have your voice actors and then you have your animators. And in stop motion, you know, we record all of the dialogue, and the, you know, the voice performance first, and then we animate to the vocal performances. So, you know, in a movie like Coraline, you have to go to Fanning, who, you know, is the voice of Coraline, and Paranorman, uh, the main character is this boy named Norman, who is voiced by Cody Schmidt McPhee, and he's, you know, they're essentially, they, they're the start of the character. But it's really up to the animators to sort of take what they've done and bring the puppet to life. So my job as an animator is to break down the action and the emotions into tiny, tiny, tiny little movements. It takes a lot of planning, and a lot of long hours, and a lot of, sometimes it gets frustrating. <laughs> but um, the results are pretty magical when you see everything come together. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all worth it in the end. <laughs> um, so, um, but I didn't really start out just animating um, that. Uh, I'll just give you a really quick, hopefully not too boring, synopsis of my early years. Um, I grew up on a farm in Baltimore, Maryland. My parents were farmers. My mom worked in a dental office in the winter. Um, but she also was an artist, and she would draw and paint. And we always had the best school projects, because my mom would you know, jump in and take over. And you know, you'd come in with this giant thing, and it's like, you didn't make that. So, but we were always encouraged to be creative and stuff. But my, my mom never really thought of it as a way to make money or to make a living. It was just a fun thing to do. But I grew up always wanting to be an artist. And when I was little, my big dream was I was gonna I was gonna make paintings and I was gonna sell them on the side of the road outside of my father's barn where no cars ever drove by. It was just you know, <laughs> there was no traffic. But that was my idea. I was gonna have my art studio and it's gonna be great. Um, and then as I sort of got into high school, um, I really got into animation and I uh, you know, I watched tons of television. I was, a, you know, a child of the TV generation. I watched every cartoon on the planet, and every bad television show, and lots of movies. And, and you know, when I was in high school, it was sort of around the rebirth of the whole Disney feature film era. So, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and, you know, those kind of, you know, the new, the new rise of the Disney films. And I was like, man, I want to be a Disney animator. That's what I want to do. And I got really, really into it, and but at the time, I mean, this was you know 1988-ish, 
And it just, like, to do animation on your own, it just wasn't, it wasn't like it is now. You know, there were, there were no digital cameras, there was no computer software that made films, like, people had Super 8 cameras, and that was it. And you had to know what you were doing, and it cost a lot of money, and so in my mind, there was no way for me to learn animation other than to go to school. Like, I just didn't, I couldn't figure out another way to do it. So, um, after high school, I went to community college for a few years, saved money, and then I ended up going to film school for animation. And I went to uh, the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, which um, was a great, a great school for just broad, broad skills. Um, they had a, a fine arts school as well as like a music school and a performing arts school. So I had classes with ballet dancers and musical theater people and saxophone players, and it was a, it was a really interesting group of people. And you know, in your college, you're just fully immersed in in art and what you want to do. So it was a great school, but it was right on the, it was sort of right on the verge of when, you know, animation was changing. And this, it was a very sort of old school system. Like we shot on film, we cut our own negative, we recorded our sound on mag tape and chopped it up in little pieces and stuck it together. And we watched all the films on a giant flatbed editor that would fill this stage. And, you know, it was, it was really, it was a cool process, but everything I learned in college is dead now, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, nobody, hardly anyone even shoots film anymore. It's getting to that point. So, but the school was great and it really, it taught us how to be filmmakers and not just animators, which on the one hand was great because you know, we can make our own films, but on the other hand, it was, they didn't really teach you how to get a job, or how to, you know, how to promote yourself, or, it was like, it taught you how to be an artist, which was great, you know. But looking back, it would have been a little nice to have had a little more, you know, a little more instruction. So like, when I got out of school, I just assumed that I wouldn't be working in the animation industry, because, I gravitated towards stop motion, and you know, in 1998, 90, what, 96, 97, there were no, it was not a huge thing happening. Like it was, you know, it was kind of an old, it was an old sort of archaic uh, form. Oh, and I forgot to mention the part about my whole drawn, my Disney career, which, <laughs> which uh, in our first semester of school. You know, we started with drawn animation, and immediately I realized that there was no way I was going to be a Disney animator because I, my drawing skills just weren't good enough. Like, you know, I could not draw things the way I wanted them to move. Like, I would, you know, my characters were constantly changing shape and getting bigger and smaller when they weren't supposed to, and I could never get the perspective right, and I found it really frustrating, and I thought, man, I'm never going to be able to do this. And then, in our second semester, we did uh, experimental animation. So we did a lot of like cut out paper and clay on glass and sand, and we did stop motion, and and that really grabbed me in a way that like I thought, oh, this I can move this and I can make it do what I want it to do, and I don't have to worry about like once I build the thing I want to move, that's it. It's you know, it's going to stay that way. Um, so in school, I ended up. Um, focusing on stop motion. I did my senior film um, in stop motion animation and a bit of drawn animation. Um, and I have my student film today, and <laughs> it's kind of hard for me to show it, but I think I'm going to show it just <laughs> because everybody, you know, it's like your first, whatever. It's like the first portrait you ever did in high school of yourself, and your face is all crooked, and you know, you think it looks great. Anyway, um, I'm gonna, it's only, it's seven minutes long, and you know, it's, it's a good example of where, you know, you saw my reel, so then you can see my student film, and you know, you can see sort of how far I've come. <laughs> um, and the film ended up winning a Student Academy Award in 97. So, 
you know, somebody liked it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so let's let's play uh, put on a happy face. Happy face, yeah. Number two. So 
they basically, after the movie was done, they went in with a computer and digitally painted out the line. And so that, and that's what they're doing on Paranorman with all the faces. So, because it would take so much time to make an entire face that has like different brows and a different mouth. This way, you can combine two different two different shapes by having the mouths and the brows separate. So yeah, crazy painstaking <laughs> stuff. Um, okay, so. Um, okay, so that was a student film we saw, and so once I once I got out of college, I was sort of it was a lot of three movies came out when I was in college: The Nightmare Before Christmas, which totally inspired me and made me want to do stop motion forever, and Jurassic Park, which scared the crap out of me because I was like, oh my god. Because originally, all the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park were supposed to be in stop motion. Phil Tippett was supposed to do all, all of the animation. He spent years doing tests. And then Dennis Muren from Industrial Light and Magic sort of developed this way to do them in CG. And when Spielberg saw the CG dinosaurs, he was like, whoa, that's what we're going to do. And so, so that, that movie was a turning point as far as like creature effects and stop motion being used for that kind of thing. Um, and the other movie was Toy Story, which was full CG animated, you know, some of the best character animation that ever came out of a computer. And that was scary too, because you, you have to understand, like, at that time, schools weren't, I mean, my school wasn't teaching computer animation, and it was just so expensive. Like, it was so expensive and it was so unknown that nobody really, Nobody knew how to do it, and, and you just couldn't learn it. So, um, so I basically felt like, wow, I just spent, you know, four years learning how to do something that, you know, is, is totally extinct and is not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to do it for a living. So I said, oh, well, that's fine, I'll teach, I'll make films, I'll do my bartending job. <laughs> so I bartended for a year after college, um, and then, I got a call from a friend of mine who worked at MTV, and he was a guy that I went to college with. He graduated the year before me. He was working on a show called Daria, drawn show, and he said, "Oh, there's all this talk about this. They're doing a stop motion show. It's called Celebrity Deathmatch, and they need animators, and they don't have anybody. They don't know anybody that does stop motion. You got to send them your film." And I was like, "Oh, wow, what? You know?" So. I sent them my student film and I got hired on the job. So I moved to New York and I worked on Celebrity Deathmatch for a year. So I worked on the first two seasons. And that was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, it, it was like a boot camp for animation. I mean, everyone there was pretty much right out of school. I mean, there were a few people that had some experience, but I mean, they didn't pay anybody anything. It was just like, you know, we were shooting in an office building in the middle of Times Square in like offices, and you know they had sprinkler systems, and it was just it was it was a crazy crazy setup. But that job, I met basically every every job I got from since MTV came from someone that I met at that studio, which is so it just blows my mind. But I mean, I got the people that I worked with there became you know my peers and this sort of small close knit stop motion world where you know you end up working with the same people over and over again because there's just not that many people that do what I do so that job had its ups and downs and most a lot of downs <laughs> we worked really long hours and you know we we spend the night at the studio, you know, and it was like college. I mean, I had just come from college, so it was kind of like the same for me, but, you know, it was, yeah, it was pretty rough. So, but after a year of that, um, some friends of mine who worked at MTV had moved to Portland to work for Will Vinton Studios on a show called the PJs, and that was, <clears throat> that was a new, I don't know if you guys remember it, it was, um, it was on the WB, starred Eddie Murphy. There were some clips in the reel from the show. Um, and it was billed as like the biggest stop motion TV show 
ever made. Because no one had done a stop motion show in the US since Gumby. You know, just, they just hadn't it, it just hadn't been cost effective and so but the network decided to give it a shot, throw a bunch of money at it, and I think the show was like it was like a million dollars an episode. That was the budget and we would shoot an episode in I think it was two months, two or three months. Um, and that was great. So I moved to Portland to work for Will Bitten Studios, which then eventually became like a later on. Um, and I worked for the second and third season of BJ's. And in between those two seasons, there was a hiatus of six months where they were doing rewrites and working on scripts and the production was pretty much shut down. So everyone was laid off and there was no, there was no working. We were just collecting unemployment for six months. And then, but we knew that we had a job, you know, coming up. So the great thing that the studio did was they opened the equipment and the space to people, to, to keep people in town, basically, um, so people wouldn't go off and find other jobs because they needed everyone in six months. So I got to make a film that summer using 35 millimeter camera, all the professional lights, you know, all the, the sets and the space, and it was like it was like a dream. And I think there was maybe 10, there was like 10 or 15 people that made films that summer, and it was really great opportunity and uh, had that film with me and it's called Terminator Tomatoes. It's a little environmental thriller. <laughs> it's only five minutes long. Um, and that was really a good example of like, you know, people I knew in the in the industry helped me a lot. I had people help me build sets and I had people help me light it and you know the community really was we were all working together because you know we were all out of work and just kind of hanging around. So um, it, took, it took about six months, it took pretty much the whole six months to make the film. Um, I was shooting every day for at least four months, just in the studio on the boiling heat. <laughs> so, um, right, so let's show Terminator Tomatoes. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> next. Um, so yeah, and that's a that's a photo from MTV. Those are the Beastie Boys. Uh, <laughs> animating the Beastie Boys. A few photos from the PJs. There's me in a car. This is to prove that I've had the same haircut for 14 years. <laughs> um, some shots of the characters. I don't have too many photos from those days. Um, these are some photos from Terminator Tomatoes. You can get an idea of the scale of the set. Um, there were two sets built for that film. One, one of the field and one of the porch. So it was only two sets. And, you know, I, I shot the film pretty much in order so I could change the field as, as I went through. So there's, you know, all the plants. So every, you know, every couple days I'd add more things to the set. Click through to the next one. That's, so just to give you an idea of the scale, I think it's always neat for me to see, like, how, because you always want to, how big was that? How small was that? That's the porch. <coughs> the porch. Um, okay, and these are some, I think, you don't need to see all of these, but I'm just going to talk and you can just kind of click click through them and uh, yeah. Hold on. So just, okay. So just really briefly, like after after I made the film and then I went back to Blue Mitten and we worked on PJs. Um, the show was then canceled and everyone was laid off and I ended up going to San Francisco to work for a few months, six months. Um, and that sort of began my freelance nomadic lifestyle where I would work six months in one place, then I'd move, and I'd work six months in another place, and move. But I sort of, uh, I kept Portland as a home base. So I kept my husband here and my house and all my stuff. <laughs> and then I moved around and, and worked. And so um, these photos are from a job I did in Frankfurt, Germany. So I spent six months in Germany working on this really strange fairy tale that I will not show you because it's too weird. <laughs> but um, there's a shot of it in the reel. And, but it was really fun to travel and you know meet different people in the stop motion universe. Um, and then I came back to Portland after Germany and I did, I worked in animation, but I didn't, there just wasn't a ton of work and usually those jobs, you know, you need one or two animators on a commercial. So I ended up doing a lot of art department stuff, building props and painting sets and just doing whatever I could to stay employed. And so a lot of these photos are from commercial work that I did. Um, most of them were from a place called Ben's Image Lab. They're another studio here in town. They do commercials and a few TV shows and things. Um, these are from a Reese's Pieces spot that we, uh, so I helped build sets and, you know, but I wasn't animating that much just because there just wasn't that much work. Um, and then right after I did that for a while, then I went to LA and worked on Robot Chicken. And that was, um, I actually got that job because I had two, two of my friends that I worked with on Celebrity Deathmatch were the animation directors on that show. <coughs> and so again, MTV comes back to supply me with work. Um, and so I moved to LA for six months and I worked on Robot Chicken and I met lots of great people there. Um, and that was a crazy, you know, that was a crazy show and we had, we just were shooting, shooting and shooting and shooting. Our shooting quota was between 10 and 12 seconds a day so I know it doesn't sound like a lot probably to most people, but like on a feature film, we shoot between five to six seconds a week. So you kind of, if you've ever seen Robot Chicken, and you've seen some of the shots on the reel, I mean, it's, it's very crude, it's very fast paced um, animation. But it was, you know, it was really great. And also it became a training ground for another generation of animators who now I'm working with some on this new feature. So it's sort of like the deathmatch of its day, Robot Chicken. Um, I think if we go forward, there's a couple of Robot Chicken things after this somewhere. Um, so I did that, and there it is, the chicken. Um, I animated part of the title sequence for that, so you know, even when it's on, there's still a little piece of me in there somewhere. <laughs> um, 
but it was cool. You know, it was LA, and you know, Seth Green was in charge of the show, and you know, he knows all these celebrities, so there was always people on the set, just meeting weird people, um, people doing voices. <coughs> I missed meeting Weird Al by like one day, which ah, oh, so upset. But um, so you know, so if you look at these, you know, these are all sets from from Robot Chicken. You can see the, the scale. You know how small the puppets are. They were just toys. Basically, plastic toys with wire shoved in them. Um, this was, I got to do this whole Brady Bunch sequence, which was really fun. Um, they really did a great job building this set. I mean, it really looks exactly like the Brady Bunch living room. Um, but, you know, it was totally crude and violent, and they were shooting and blowing each other up and stuff. But that just sort of gives you an idea of the scale of there's Alice and some business going on the floor. Um, and so after after Robot Chicken, I did you know a Christmas special um, with a studio called Fix Picks. It was also in L A. So I came back to Portland for a little bit. I went back to L A. Um, this was a sort of failed. It was like, oh, it's going to be the next Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It'll play every year at Christmas. And it really ended up being just a giant Walmart commercial, <laughs> <laughs> which was you can see in the. the this is the Walmart. Yeah, so you can see the Walmart sign there. Um, yeah, it was. It was okay. You can stop flipping through now, and I'll talk a little bit about Coraline. Okay, so yeah, so it was just a big marketing thing by Walmart. It was sponsored by Walmart, and the DVDs were only going to be sold in Walmart. And I'm reading the script, and I'm like, but they go to the Walmart? Really? Like that's that's what's happening here? It was just. It was crazy, and there was like. Campbell Soup and Sony PlayStation. There was all this like product placement in it. It was just, it was pretty bad. <laughs> and it played one Christmas and it never saw the light of day again. But you know, it was fun to work on, and you know, maybe it'll play again. It was called Holidays with a Z. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it'll resurface, but I doubt it. Okay, so after all that business happened, then in December 2006, um, I was hired on Coraline, and Coraline was a pretty big it was a pretty big deal in this town for for animators and just the filmmaking community in general. Um, there hadn't been a stop motion feature shot in the U.S. for many, many, many years since I think Monkey Bone. The Henry Selleck movie, which was half stop motion, was the last really big feature film. Um, they were shooting stuff in England, but not here. And so it was, you know, it was pretty exciting. And when I was hired on the job, it was, you know, it was a, it was a pretty big deal for me. I mean, it was my first feature, and I got to stay in town. You know, I was going to be employed for two two whole years, but you know, of employment, which you know, in my business. It's sort of unheard of. Um, and so when I started the job, I really quickly learned the difference between, you know, the TV commercial world and the feature film world. It's like sort of like night and day. Like suddenly the production is huge. It's so gigantic. And there are so many people. And, you know, the level of animation is so intense and you know, I, I struggled, I will admit, for the first six months to sort of keep up and please the director, Henry Selleck, and, you know, I mean, he directed The Nightmare Before Christmas. It was like, you know, you, you try not to be a dork, but, you know, it's like, that was the movie, you know, that, that was a big movie for me, and now this guy is, you know, telling me what to do every day. It's kind of, it's just crazy. Um, and so, the whole, I had really had to readjust my whole way of working. Because on a feature, you're not just shooting and shooting and shooting. There's a lot of character development involved. There's a lot of getting the style perfect, getting the shots perfect. Um, on a feature, we don't just shoot a shot. We do a block. So we do a block, a rehearsal, and then we shoot. So it's, it, 
as if it wasn't as tedious enough, you know, the animation, it becomes even more tedious because you are doing the same scene over and over again until it's perfect. Because unlike computer or drawn animation, you can't really go back in and fix things. You know, I mean, you can, but it's very expensive. So stop motion is shot just straight ahead. So when I do a shot, I start at the beginning, and then I finish at the end. And if something goes wrong in the middle, I have to erase what I've done and start over. Does that make sense? <laughs> so, so, you know, in a feature film, you'll, you'll get the storyboard, and you'll, you know, talk with the director, you'll sort of work out the scene, the main actions that have to happen, and then you'll do what's called a block, which is, it's just like acting. If, if you've ever done, you know, like, basically where the character has to go, to, just to convey the general emotion of the scene. So we'll shoot a shot with like every 10 or 12 frames. So a block will be 10, 10 to 12 frames for every pose. And then we'll go and do a rehearsal, which is like a practice run, basically. So then we'll go and animate the whole scene on twos or fours. So for every, you know, so it's choppier and you're not animating the hair and the clothes, you're just getting the general movement of it. And if there's anything you need to test, like something falling or, you know, something you're not sure about, you do that in the rehearsal and then you shoot the shot. So it's, it's pretty intense. So by the time you're shooting the shot, it's, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty, pretty perfect or as close to perfect as stop motion can be. Um, which is what I like about it because there's always little happy accidents that happen while you're shooting that you don't really plan for. And, you know, unlike CG, there's not 30 people with their hands on the shot, you know. If you've, done, if you've ever done computer animation, it's like you'll do a pass and then someone else will animate the hair and then someone else will do the fur and then someone else does the texturing and then someone else does the lighting. And, you know, and then you're just changing it, changing it. And then by the end, it has this, all the spontaneity of the original animation pass is gone. So stop motion, it's pretty much what you see is what you get as far as like when you're shooting. And the other thing about the feature world is that it really, it gives you like, oh yeah, there's some pictures. <laughs> That's uh, that's me and Red Shift. That's uh, the garden set. So you can see the scale, like the difference between the scale of a TV show and a feature. And that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big set. That's at the end of the garden. Um, and okay, so so basically, like on a feature and in stop motion, you really have tons and tons of different artists, painters, sculptors, all sort of coming together. And you know, my job is just a tiny little part of the filmmaking process. I mean, Coraline had 30 animators. Um, only eight of them were women. Just throwing it out there. Um, so 30 animators and over 300 general crew members. So set builders, camera people, production people, people running the show, like, so a lot of times I feel like the animators get a lot of the credit, but you know, I can't do anything with my job without you know, the people starting out building everything and getting it all together. And sort of the animation is kind of the final, final stage. So that's the shot. That's the web that Coraline falls into at the end of the movie. And those are a bunch of the animators standing underneath the web. It, that thing was humongous. And there's me with Spank. I think that's about it. There's a few more photos, but I think we should get to the making of. So Patrick, if you want to come out of that, go back to the DVD. So now I'm going to show you this sort of uh, making of time lapse thing that like Studios has put together um, from from Coraline. It's something that a lot of people don't get to see, so it's it's pretty neat, and you'll see the animated shot, and then you'll see the animator sort of working in the time-lapse fashion. So you can kind of see how it's done, sets being built, things like that. So yeah, if you want to roll the time-lapse,
don't know. Do you guys want to hear some interesting facts about paranormal? Do we have time? We don't, it's okay. <laughs> They're kind of fun just to think of the, the scale, the scope of the movie. Aaron, whatever you need to cut me off, just cut me off. Okay. Um, so, really quick, um, I just want to talk a little about the puppets really fast. So, um, there's, by the end of the film, there'll be 28 Norman puppets. So, identical Norman puppets. The Norman is the main character of the, of the film. Um, there are at least 12 people involved with making each puppet over the course of several months. It takes three or four months to make a puppet um, from start to finish, and then once the first one's made, then the duplicates are made afterwards. Um, on Coraline, we had approximately 140 puppets, um, 20 unique characters, and on Paranorman, we'll have 169 by the end, um, and 60 unique characters. Um, the puppets use a combination of mechanical heads and replacement faces, so you can see over there, I showed you the Coraline faces, the Paranormal faces are the same, and some of the heads are mechanical, so they have joints inside of them, like the father there, you can see his, his face is, it's movable, so it has, it has points inside, so his face doesn't come off, it moves um, with, with the silicone that's around him. Um, inside every puppet is a metal skeleton like this. Um, this is an example of an armature that we're using on the film. Um, each armature has over 15 to 20 different joints, and each joint moves and holds its shape, so you know, the puppet can do whatever it needs to do. Um, and if you guys want to come up later and get a closer look at these things, I'm totally fine with that. Um, just don't touch them because they don't belong to me. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, you know, with the replacement faces, um, just to give you an example, like a shot that was, say, 650 frames, which is 27 seconds long, it's a long shot. It doesn't seem, it doesn't sound very long, but it's a long shot. Um, a shot like that took 250 different faces to to get the movement, to get the action. So in in the Paranormal Library, we have over 18,000 faces. So you can get an idea of like the scope of everything. Um, the shooting space is over 50,000 square feet. Um, so it's pretty big. There's 40 different functioning sets. Um, and by the end of the film, we'll the set department will have created 35 different locations. So if you imagine going on a live action movie, going to 35 different places but having to build them all by hand and in, in a tiny scale. <laughs> um, so I think I think that's good. Are there any questions anybody wants to ask? Yeah. No, that's okay. So going back to the very beginning, um, I was kind of curious, like when something, when a commercial like the um, so he has a very, he has a very stupid look for the character that already exists when you're doing something like creating a 3D character. Yeah. Do you have like an entire team that kind of comes up with what that team is going to look like? Or is oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a whole, um, it was a, it was a pretty big deal. Like Mr. Peanut has never been in three dimensions. He's always been drawn. And so, yeah, that was a huge, you know, it's a huge marketing department, and there was a lot involved with getting the look, getting the look right. So the people at Leica had a whole team of people sculpting, and you know, I mean, the approval process was probably pretty insane. Like I wasn't involved with that, but you know, it's like they're sculpting him, showing him to like 50 different people that work at Planners, and then those people are like, "Ooh, no, that foot doesn't look right," or whatever, and then it's getting changed and. So by the time it gets to the animation point, a lot of people have signed off on the look and feel. And in commercials, more than anything, there's always a ton of people that, you know, want to put their two cents in something. Um, 
But yeah, so the Flanders thing was a pretty big deal, and they were real nervous about how it looked, you know. And even the the very first shot in the commercial where he's like, I, when I throw a party, blah, 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 and he's like walking towards the bar. The first time we animated that shot, Mr. Peanut was kind of walking with his cane, you know, like down on the ground. And the animator spent, you know, two weeks doing that shot, animating all those puppets and getting everything in there. And then after it was done, the agency decided that he looked like he was like using his cane too much. <laughs> They're like, no, no, Mr. Peanut's cool. He doesn't like need the cane. He just is holding it. So, so basically, so the shot had to be redone. And the animator that originally did the shot had already moved on to another project. So then I got to come in and redo the shot with him holding the cane up so he doesn't look crippled. <laughs> so that's a really good example of the kinds of things that can happen in that sort of situation. Anybody else? Questions? Yeah. I'm wondering how, so you said there were 30 animators on the mm -hmm. Like How do you divide up who animates what? Like, is it like maybe you do an entire scene to animate all the characters in one scene if it's like a smaller scene? Or is it like you kind of animate more a certain character because you know how they move? Or like how do you? Like yeah, do you it, that's a good question. It's, um, it's tricky because, like, on, on Coraline, um, there weren't that many characters, so, you know, in that instance, like, it'd be nice if, like, everybody could have their own character, but on Coraline, like, everyone had to animate Coraline, so every animator needed to know exactly how she moved, what she would do, what she wouldn't do. Um, and then, as the sort of process starts, the director kind of, they do casting, so it's, it's almost like, you know, a real, like, with real people, like, they'll cast certain animators to do certain characters. So, like, I, by the middle of the movie, I was doing most of the Spank and Forcible shots because um, the director liked the way I animated them. And a bunch of other people did shots too, but, you know, so it's sort of like people, you know, they try different things out and then um, some animators will become a lead on a character and then the other animators need to match that style. So, like, Trey Thomas was, was the lead on the mother, like Coraline's mother. So he would animate most of the shots, but then, you know, if I had a shot with her, I would have to watch what he had done and sort of try to emulate and get the same nuances. <coughs> it's pretty hard. It, it, it's amazing that it works. Rather, you know, that with, there's like 30 different people all doing the same character and it, you know, it, it works. Like, like, when I watch the movie, I can tell who did what shot because, well, first of all, because I know, and you can see, like, different little things that people do, but if the movie's done well, you can't, you can't see who, who's done what, you know? It all just looks like it was done by the same person. Um, and then in, sort of, in a shot where there's, like, multiple characters, like, you probably saw in the time lapse that end garden party scene, there were eight puppets in that, in that shot, and there was... The set was huge, and so there was really no way for one animator to do all of that. I mean, you could have, but you'd have to be like walking around the set and walking around. And I had been doing most of the spin forcible stuff, and Brad Schiff, the other animator, had done you know Bobinski and the parents, and so they split the shot up. So he animated on one side, and I animated on the other. Um, that's pretty rare. Like usually, the animator is just by themselves animating because it, there's usually not enough space to have more than one person and you know it's, it's hard to, it's like drawing with someone sitting right next to you looking over your shoulder <laughs> so it's definitely um, it's rare that there'll be more than one animator on a shot at a time but sometimes it does happen does that answer your question yes okay <laughs> can i ask more yeah yeah sure um i kind of a, a two-part question so Okay. Um, so, I guess first of all, do you have like a preferred kind of method of working? Have you worked on something like Coraline where it's super detailed, you know, you do rehearsals and it's like ridiculous production and it looks amazing and you're animating like 
one on ones, and the field is having one on ones for stuff or something like that. Mostly, um, yeah. Or something that's uh, get through quicker, or maybe it's a little messier, you know? Like, mm -hmm. uh, do you kind of have a, a preference? Yeah, or <laughs> um, something in between? Or like yeah, no, it, it's interesting because at first I hated, I hated the way that the Coraline system was set up because I was so used to just shooting, shooting, and not, you know, it was it was really hard to like do all these practice runs and duplicate the same thing over and over again. Um, but after after I got used to it, now it's like I really prefer to work that way. Like I prefer to do a rehearsal just to test out everything, make sure it's going to work, um, and then shoot the shot. Um, and like I said, I. I've gone back and done some TV animation, you know, after Coraline, and I really do prefer sort of more longer form, labor intensive type of stuff. Just, I mean, sometimes it's fun to just kind of blast out a shot, but at the end of the day, like, it's just, for me, it's just a little more, it's a little more enjoyable, <coughs> the quality of the work just being so much better. Um, and it's, you know, it's tedious and hard no matter what, so even if you're going fast, you're still, you know, putting out that same amount of energy. So I think if the end product looks really great, then that's that's my preferred my preferred method, I would say. And then um, I guess I was also wondering with something like that, like uh, with the paranormal and trailer, it looks. I mean, it's so much and so sophisticated now that it looks absolutely amazing. I don't even know if this really matters, but it's kind of something that I think about. Like, what, like, do you feel like stop motion kind of differentiates itself from something like CG? Or, or do you think it's important to kind of like differentiate stop motion from something like CG? Or do you think there's something stop motion can do that CG just can't? Yeah. You know, because it starts to kind of look. It's, it's starting, yeah, it's starting to get pretty slick. Yeah. yeah and, and I know a lot of people, you know, they 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 see the trailer and they're like, oh, is that computer or is that stop motion? Like, it you know, it's getting to that point. And my hope is that it doesn't become so slick and you know glossy that you miss the little things. Um, but I think I I think there really is a difference, and people can. People can see it even if they don't know what it is exactly that they're seeing. You know, like when I watch a CG film, the fact that you know the characters never stop moving that drives me crazy. I mean, <laughs> but you know that's because. But if you watch a stop motion movie, there you know there are pauses. There's like weird little flickers. Sometimes you see wires. Like you know, there's there's little accidents that happen that that aren't just aren't in CG film. And I, and I think the you know the tactile look of it. I think I mean of course CG is of course amazing, and they're you know they're getting they're getting all the textures right, the hair and the fur and the water, and you know they're doing a really good job. But I feel like there's still something in stop motion that will be recognizable as a real thing and not something that's digital. That's my hope anyway. So fingers crossed. Okay, wrap it up. That was amazing, and we're super over time, but it was so worth it. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That was, thank you for coming to Sire Nation. <laughs>